Hello. Good morning. Uh, everything should be okay now. I had a little bit of trouble logging in. So I, did, I had to log in several times before I accepted my password. Okay. Um, is everything okay? Do you see the desktop? And do you, do you hear me? Good morning. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. So, um, okay. Remember today, it, it, there's a, 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 your second exam, and there's a little message here about it. It, it you know, you'll be able to down just like last time. It's gonna be exactly like last time. So you'll be able to download it when class is over with, and it's due 11 o'clock this evening. So you have all the rest of the day to do it. Okay. All right. And what we'll do today is first, if anyone's got any last uh, any questions about the review problems, we'll go over any questions about review problems, and then otherwise we'll, we'll look at some more examples of, of arrays. And there's another reading assignment for uh, about arrays. And that's, this is actually like what we're going to be talking about. We're talking about these things here: traversing array with loops. Whoops, sorry, meant to mean to click. All right, all right. So first, where are they down here? Okay, here's the review problems. Anybody got any question about the review problems? Any pro review problem you want to ask about now? Any question about these? Can you go over number 18? 18? Yes. Okay, let's see. Down here. Okay. Um, all right, so let me, let me copy it into the Java visualizer as a way to play with it. Okay, so here's what we're given. Okay, so that's what we're given. So this is the code we want to modify. Now, okay, so let's read what it says. If n is a negative number, you return negative one. Okay, then it says else if n is zero or less than one. So if n is between zero and one, okay, but n is an integer, okay? Um, see, n is, this is a method, okay? So, and we're talking here that n is an integer. There are no integers between zero and one other than zero and one. Yeah, this is a little bit funny, written kind of funny. Okay, see, this is n is equal to zero, n is equal to one, and there's nothing in between them. So this is just saying n is zero or one. So, you know, you could change this right away to, okay, let me uh, pull it out of the comment. That's, that's what we started with. Here's what we're going to change it to. Okay, here's what we're going to change it to. First of all, we notice that there are no integers between zero. There are no integers between zero and one, so this could be written like this. So that's one simplifying thing. Okay. Now, but then, okay, if n is less than zero, and that's strictly less than zero, negative one. If n is zero or n is one, we return zero. Okay. Or if n is strictly greater than one. Now, strictly greater than one for an integer would be greater than, you, you write this, greater than or equal to two, okay? Okay? Because if it was equal, and also down here, strictly less than zero now means really negative one and lower, because less than or equal to, okay? So if we think on the number line, this is for the numbers one and below, this is for the numbers zero and one, and this is for the numbers two and above, okay? <laughs> so if we think of it as a number line, something it's, it's good to draw a number line for these. So think of a number line. The, the key numbers on the number line for us in this case is, here's gonna be negative one, and here's uh, zero. The numbers we're given in this problem are negative one, zero, one okay so 
negative one. Everything less than that is going to be one case. And zero is another case. And then one is another case. And then everything two and above So you think so everything two and above is gonna be another case. So we have now there should be one this is one case, everything negative one and to the left. These two numbers are another case. Okay. And then this is the third case. There's only three cases. That's one, two, three cases. But this is the this is the case of everything that isn't this case. So we can just make that an else case, okay? Notice that this line, we never got there because right now the way this is working, it says if n is less than one, that's one case, okay? So that was one case. The next case was these two. The next case is everything to the right here. So there's nothing left. So you never get to this thing here. You always fall into either that bucket, that bucket, or that bucket, that bucket, those three buckets make up the whole real line. So you never get to this thing here. Okay, Notice, so that's real important to see because you have to analyze the cases carefully. This bucket is everything this from here to here. Okay, then this bucket is these two. Okay, and then this bucket is from here on. There's nothing left. So we can just delete this here, okay. And also we can change this to just an else because the first if says everything to the left here, the next if says these two, and then we're left with what's left. Oops. What's left is two and above. So there's, a, there's the least we need to write to make that method. This is what the answer was. This is the simplest least that we would need to write. If n is negative, or if n is less than or equal to one, if n is less than or equal to negative one, that's our one case. If n is zero or one, that's our second case. And our third case is everything else. So we return negative one for the numbers down here. We return zero for these two numbers. And we return one for these numbers up, up here and above, okay? And then we could kind of test it if we wanted to. We could say uh, int r1 is, this method is called in the interval. Okay, in the interval with input, say, negative 5. Okay. And int r2 will make that uh, in the interval with input negative 1. And then int do a bunch of test cases. Int R3 is in the interval, say with, well, our next boundary point, well, it's with the number zero, okay? And then int R4 in the interval with uh, one, say, let's just go up the number line with our, see, you, you do all, you know, try testing all the cases and then int, R5 equal in the interval, say, 2, and then try something okay, yeah, so I've got something something less, something to the left here, something right on that number, right on that number, right on that number, right on that number, and something out here. So I, yeah, I, I probably tested every, every possible test. So Go see if it works. We'll see. Oh, no. What did I do wrong? Oh, I put it in the wrong place. See, it's outside of my brace. I, I have to move. I, I, I put it outside of my class. So that brace goes away, and I need to uh, put a brace down here. Oh, okay. And I, oh, yeah. I, I, I made a mistake when I took the indentation out of this. I forgot that this was a method, okay? And then the comment starts here. 
Okay, now I got it set up right. So there's the number line to help you think. With problems like this, with, with a bunch of if statements, when they're evolving numbers, it kind of helps sometimes to draw a number line to get a sense of where the numbers come from and to visually see that the problem is, is uh, uh, you know, negative one and to the left, zero and one, two and to the right. Okay, now, now it should compile. Okay, now I can just jump over all the execution. Okay, did I get the right answers? You know, negative one, negative one for the numbers that were negative five and negative one. And then, uh, oh, let's see. See, I didn't get the right answer. Anyway, see, R3, I got zero, zero. I got one, 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 one. Okay, did I make some kind of little mistake here? Ah, I see what I did wrong. Anybody, okay, go back to my code. Uh, is the error in the ands? Should it yeah. be or? Right. See, this was if n is uh, between 0 and 1. See, this was n is between 0 and 1. Now, we said there isn't any ends between 0 and 1. So it's really just are you at this end or that end? And I forgot to change the and to an or. See, I've got to change that and to an or. So see, remember, so we 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 cited as this case was n is between it's gr large greater than or equal to zero and it's less than less than or equal to one. So it was this interval here. But we said there's nothing. There's a, the only integers in that interval are the two endpoints, zero or one. So see how important it is to test even even simple code because they're so easy to make little mistakes. Like in this case, I was copying from here up to here. I had the right idea, but I forgot to make one of the changes in this code. I forgot to make a change in it. So my test helped me see that I forgot something. Okay, so now visualize it. Just go to the end. Okay, negative one, negative one, zero, zero, one, one. Okay, so I, yeah, the tests really make a difference in, in real programming. Tests are ubiquitous. I think, I don't know if I ever mentioned to you that in a company like Microsoft, a big company like that, they divide programmers up into different groups. And a lot, especially the entry level programmers, their job is to only write the tests. So for example, in a case like this, a, a more experienced programmer would write the code and an entry level programmer would write the tests. Yeah. And sometimes one programmer does both. So in some places, everybody who writes code has to write their own tests also. But it's actually pretty common to split that up between two different people. One person writes the code and one person writes the test. And it's actually kind of a good idea. That way the tester isn't biased with what they think the code is doing. The tester says, I'm just writing the test. I tried to come up with a bunch of good tests and the, pro and the other person's writing the code themselves. If the person writes their own test, sometimes they, they get a bias. They think their code is right. So they don't necessarily test it as hard as they should. Or they don't think they don't uh, they don't really analyze it clearly. Like they might test it with the same kind of error and thinking that they use to write the code. So, but tests are ubiquitous. We even there's a phrase test driven development that that uh, there's a whole style of programming called test trust trust test driven development. Yeah, you. The test-driven development says you write the test first and then you write the code. You know, in test-driven development, you would write this first, which showed that you knew what the thing should do. So the tests essentially say, here's what should be done. So you write the test first and then you write the code to pass the test. The, the tests are so important that in test-driven development, the tests are usually written first, okay? All right. So that was a good, you know, so so you notice that even in a simple thing like this, I needed to test to make sure I didn't do some goofy little thing like forget to change that or that change that and to an or, okay? All right, so make sure you have tests. And and when, when problems like, th when problems like this of, of mutually, remember these are supposed to be mutually exclusive. You're either in this case or you're in this case or you're in that case. And there's no overlapping. Because if you're in this case, you drop out and you drop, you you go, you don't even make any of these other tests. 
If you fall into this, you drop out. You don't even check that. So you only do one, if, if it's if, else, if, else, if, you only do one of these. You only do either that, that, or that. You can't do two out of three. You have to do one out of three. So it's good to think of them in terms of like, in this case, think of it in terms of a number line. How do the inputs group together on a number line? That can make it easier to analyze the program. Okay, so, so any question about this one? Any question about how I did that? There's no recipe for how to do these. You know, I, these are good problems because you know someone's just saying, look at that and figure it out. You know, there, no one's saying here's the rules for how to solve these kind of problems. Like, you know, a number line might help. It might in, in some problems, a number line won't help at all, but a number line might help. You know, you, you're just given some code, and you have to reason through it to see what's going on. So it, 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 they're, they're, they, re, they really make you have to think about what's going on here because it's not a mechanical thing. You can't just say, oh, I do these steps. It's not like doing an algebra problem where you just do certain steps. Okay, what about another? any other one from the homework problem? Any question about this one or other question about the homework or the, the review problems? Uh, can you do 17? I'm not sure if I have it right. Oh, I can't hear you. You're, you're, you're kind of garbled. Right? Oh, I'm sorry. I was saying, can you go over 17? I'm not sure if, if I have that one right. Okay, 17. Let me copy it and paste it into. Okay, here's the problem. Let's see. Oh, so it's got one, two, three lines of code. That's what it, yeah. The body of the method has three statements. Statement is just a fancy word for a line of code. So it's got three, see, three semicolons. Each semicolon is a statement in Java. Okay, and it says, can you do it in just one statement? Can you make it as simple as possible? Okay, now let's see what it's doing. Oh, and then um, I'll take this version and I'll copy it up above so that we can. So that's the original version. Here's what we'll, we'll. Okay, here's where we can change. So the name of the method is is inside. Okay, so okay is inside. First, we start off by guessing that inside is false. So we're guessing no, you're not inside. Whatever inside means. Then it says okay if n is strictly greater than zero and strictly less than 100, inside's true. Okay, so if we think in terms of a number line, the problem was a number line problem. This one's a number line problem where you've got two numbers on the number line, just zero and 100. So the only two numbers on the number line are zero and 100. And it's basically saying that you're in here. That's true. Notice it doesn't include the, the uh, oh, not zero and 100. It's um, N and 100. No, I'm sorry. N is, N is the parameter. And the question is, where's N? N is the parameter. And the question is, where's N on the number line? You know, so N is the number we're given. And where is it on the number line? Okay. True is inside means strictly between zero and 100. Okay, so true means notice that your uh, n is strictly greater than zero, so it's to the right of zero, and it's strictly less than 100, so it's to the left of 100. Okay, so we, if we visualize on a number line, inside is this part, then outside would be this or that is outside. Okay. Now, can we write that? It says now, what is the simplest statement that will work? We're supposed to write it in uh, a single line of code. Okay, we're supposed to write it in a single line of code. Okay, this is true, everything else is false. Okay, so we're supposed to return true when this is the case and false everywhere else. So here's what I'm gonna do. 
I want to return. There's my one line of code. My one line of code is going to be a return. I want to write a return when I'm in this interval here. So I want return true when n is strictly greater than zero and n is strictly less than 100. Okay. Notice that essentially that's what I wrote in here. See, if this is true, return true. Otherwise, you're returning false. So right here, if I want to make it easier to read, by, I don't have to put parentheses around, but maybe it makes it easier to read. Return this. What does this say? This says you're true if you're in this interval and you're false otherwise. Okay, so there's the one line that I need to return. Okay, that's all I do. And again, you know, the number line helps, I think. You know, in this case, not every problem can be have can be used a number line, but these are problems about involving uh, inequalities. So a number line helps. Again, we draw a picture of it. We say, okay, we, we're guessing that we're in size. So we guess that in size false. Then if this is true, we make inside true and we return the result. So if this was false, we would still be returning false. So we return true when this is true and we return false when this is false. So essentially that means that's exactly what we're doing. Return true when this thing's true, return false when this thing's false. Okay, might as well do some tests, okay? Uh, int r1 equals is inside, okay, what about negative five? Int r2 equals is inside, let's test the edge. Well, what about zero should not be inside? Int r3 equals, see, uh, uh, 100 is not supposed to be inside, okay? And int, R4 equal okay, something to the right of 100. Okay, that should not be inside. So what should we get? This should be, uh, oh, oh, I didn't test for anything that is inside. So what, something that is inside. I'll just take uh, one. That's the first number. That means that's the first number that is inside. You know, one. And the last number that is inside, you know, if I, you know, 99. Okay. Now, see, I, if I was the guy writing the test code, I would want to make sure that they got the edge right. We call these, ed we call them edge cases. I would think, okay. They, they should get the edge right. So actually I should make me that negative one because those are where the edges are. Negative one is the last number that's out. That, well, negative one is outside, zero's outside. So negative one is outside, zero's outside. Okay, one would be inside. That's like the first number that's on the inside. Then 99 is the last number that's on the inside. So I'm checking on the extreme ends. Then 100 should already be on the outside and anything to the right of 100. So yeah, I could try make sure 101, okay? All right, so that should be outside, outside, inside, inside, outside, outside. Okay, so test it. Oh, what did I do wrong? Oh, um, this thing's returning Boolean, not int. See, I was thinking about like the last problem. So these are all Boolean results. Okay, there, fix that. Just go to the end. Okay, false, false, true, true, false, false. Outside, outside, inside, inside, outside, outside. Yeah, if I think of my, my test, yeah, I'm I'm testing kind of like right on the edges. You know, the last number that's outside is zero. The first number that's inside would be one. The last number that'd be inside would be 99. Then 100 should be outside. So I think in terms of my 
you know, I, I think in terms of what this picture looks like, and I make sure I test the edges. Edges are where you tend to make bugs have mistakes in error, error in logic. So in, in real world programming, when somebody writes the test cases, they'll always make sure they get the, and they're called edge, they're called edge cases. Yeah, like if you, you can Google the phrase, you'll see, you know, there's a whole Wikipedia page. Well, actually, what is that? That is that, yeah, a, a, a problem or situation that occurs only at the extreme operating parameters. Okay, you know, when you're on the edges of something, what is edge cases in software testing? See, what are edge cases in software testing? That's the, the first things that the person doing the testing is gonna think. First, make sure I test all the edge cases. And here are the edge cases would be, you know, the last number that's on the outside, the first number that's in the inside, the last number that's on the inside, the first number that's on the outside. You know, so you would, you would make sure you wanted to, you wanna make sure you got all the edge cases. That's an important strategy in, in testing. Make sure you test the edge cases. It even shows, you know, what are edge cases in software testing? What are edge cases in programming? Oh yeah, some people call them corner cases. Yeah, yeah, you're on the edge, you know, you're on the edge, in this case it's edge case because you're actually on the edge of an interval in a number line. But in general, the things that where there's some little change where, where Somehow when your, your function will change result from one kind of thing to another kind of thing, when you get to some edge or corner, you, know, you need to test those cases. You need to make sure you test the things where, where the function changes its result. Here, the, those, were the, those were the places where the function changed from false to true. Yeah. This is where it changed from true to false. Those are the edge cases. Okay. And yeah. Um, that, yeah, that's always like step one of writing test cases is, did you cover all the possible edge cases? Okay, all right. So notice, real, you know, that, notice that the, what we switch from, you might think that's easier to read. And, and that's actually kind of strange. This is kind of tricky. When you boil it down to just one line of code, you know, it, it's actually becomes a little bit harder to read than this one. See, uh, you know, here, you, you see, you have, a, you have a variable name, so you're thinking, oh, it's what's inside. We start off guessing that inside is false. Then what's what do we mean by true? Oh, it's the case where n is between zero and and 100. That's what we mean by inside is true, and then we return inside. Yeah, it might even feel like this is easier to read, but this is definitely the better way to write it. One line of code is better than three lines of code. Okay, so this would actually be the right way to write this function. If it was written this way, someone would come and, you know, if, if you wrote it this way at a job, somebody would probably go and uh, change it to this. They probably wouldn't be left this way. If, 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 if the code was examined by somebody else, they'd probably say, oh, that can be simplified to that. Okay, so one, and once you get used to reading these, this is this is easy to read because it's just one line of code. But at first, you might actually think that this was better to write because it might seem that this is clearer. But we still prefer one line of code like this over three lines like that. Okay. Oh, what, one hint is <clears throat> when you're returning booleans, you shouldn't be returning true or false. You should just one way to think about it is you should just return the boolean expression. Notice I'm not returning the words true and false. I'm returning the result of this, which is either true or false. See, I'm not returning, I'm not setting something equal to true. I'm just saying, well, this thing's either true or false. So that's what I want to return. I want to return a Boolean. So that thing is either true or false. That is a Boolean. So return that. Okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, okay. is that what you had? Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Thank yeah. You. It, it it's a um, learning to the learning to switch from this kind of thing. This is not wrong. Okay. Learning to switch from this kind of thinking to this kind of thinking is is good practice. You know, we eventually you know you really want to write code like this. You want to think in terms of booleans. You know, you instead of thinking in terms of variables, you can you can start thinking in terms of expressions. That's the expression that gives me the right answer. So I'm just going to return that expression. And, and that's like a, a higher level of thinking from thinking in terms of variables. I have this variable 
that is false. And then depending on this condition, I set the variable to true. Then I return the variable. Pretty common way for thinking, especially at the beginning, but it's, at some point you start thinking, well, it's just returning that expression. So, so it's a little bit higher order of way of thinking. You know, the, to not so much think in terms of variables all the time, but sometimes to think in terms of, oh, there's the formula that gives me the right answer. The formula is N is between zero and 100. Okay. What about another one from the review? Any other one from the review? Another problem from the review? Can you do number 11? Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 So I'll do the same thing. I'll I'll copy and paste it over to so we have the problem. Okay. So the pro here's the problem. Okay. And let's see. So we're gonna be taking this method and filling in the blanks. So Okay, there's the so, okay, there's the method with the blanks in it. That's not going to compile, but we'll fill them in. Okay, now they don't tell you what this function is supposed to do. Fill in the blanks so that the following method definition is correct. Well, what's it supposed to do? Well, if the name of the function is is of you know most programmers are going to give a function a name that really helps you. So there's two slots here. And it says minimum. So you can just assume that this is the minimum of these two numbers. Well, okay, so make that two numbers. This is a double, this is a variable A. So let's make this a double A and a double B. Okay, so there's our two numbers. Okay, so minimum of two numbers. Now they're both doubles. So if we're computing the minimum of them, the return value here will be another double. So the return value here will also be a double. Okay, so minimum of two numbers, we're, I'm just going by the name, that the name should be right. So there were two slots, you know, the comma made, made me realize that there were two slots on the, on the right-hand side. So one of them was a double, now make the other one a double. It wouldn't make so much sense to make one an int and one a double. If I go back, oh, I'm doing this in the wrong place. Uh, this was supposed to be the one we left. Okay, so, okay, that's the original here. So, double. Now, you notice that it would be kind of dumb to make that an int. That wouldn't make any sense. I mean, it would be two numbers. I'd be taking the minimum of that int and that double, and that could actually work, but it'd be kind of dumb. Okay, so make that a double. Uh, you know, take the minimum of two doubles, and so the answer will be a double. Uh, professor, I have a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, instead of double A, could you potentially wrote float A and still have it work properly? Yes, but since one of them was a double, that would also be kind of goofy. Okay. Okay. So it, and so int, I could actually can, I can make it an int. I could make it a double because I can compare um, a float because I can compare floats to doubles. See, I can make a comparison between them and I can subtract them, but it'd be kind of goofy. Like, why would you take the minimum of a float and a double? Yeah, it, it, and, and it's not wrong. I mean, there might be somebody said, oh, that's what I wanted. But since, uh, you, since you're not, you, you would basically go with what's like the simplest answer or what would make, the, what would make sense in the, most in the most often case. So like if just somebody, kind of go off context clues? Pardon me? Just go off like context clues? Yes, like here, like one of them's a double, you want the minimum of two things, make it two doubles. It would be kind of like, you know, why would you think that someone was taking the minimum of, a, of an int and a double? Okay, so so use the use what's here to kind of reason about what's the most likely thing. The most likely thing would be double double. Okay, two doubles wouldn't be right. It would work with an int here. It would work with a, a float here. It wouldn't work with a string here because you can't subtract a, a string and a number. Okay. Yeah, so it wouldn't work with string or, or, char, or char. Actually, it would work with char because I, I can't remember if it would or not. 
I think you can subtract chars from a double. Okay, but the, the most simple, the most simple case, yeah, is double there. That means the answer is going to be a double, because if we're going to return, see, we said here that the result, the return value, the, the minimum of two doubles will be a double. Here's where we're going to store the answer. The result will be a double. Okay, now we want to know what the min, which one's the minimum. So we're asking what we're asking something about a minus b. Okay, how's that going to give us the minimum? Okay, well one of these numbers is bigger than the other, and the answer, you know, the the key would be that one of them, if one of them is bigger than the other, when you subtract them, you're going to get something that's either positive or negative. So when you take two numbers and you subtract them, if you're comparing them in size, one of them is larger. So when you subtract them, you get either a positive or a negative number. If the A is larger, you get a positive number. If the A is smaller, you get a negative number. So let's check if it's strictly less than zero because that's the thing that's the boundary between positive and negative numbers. Okay, if A minus B is negative, that tells me that B is the bigger number. So if B is the bigger number, I want A here. Oh, and that makes sense. Otherwise, the result is B. See that? Oh, that makes sense now. It's, make, it's making sense now. A minus B is going to be a number. And if I'm trying to figure out which one's larger or smaller, I probably want to compare this difference to zero because when one of them is larger, A minus B is going to be, if, if A is larger, A minus B will be positive. If B is larger, A minus B will be negative. Okay, so put a zero here. Then that's exactly what I want. If B is larger, so the result is negative, that means that A is smaller, otherwise B is smaller, then I return result, okay? And that was, okay. Now, do some test cases, okay? Uh, int R1 equals min two of, say, one, two. And now here, there's, I don't know what boundary cases are. I mean, th there's a lot of cases of mins and uh, min of two numbers. So I'm just going to just, yeah. um, what if I uh, ask for the min of three, three? That's like a boundary case. They're both the same number. I should just get back the answer three. And int uh, r three equals min, oh, min two, I forgot. But yeah, min two of, say, uh, Okay, here I did the smaller number came first. So let me do one where the smaller number comes second. Okay, so here the smaller number came first. Here the numbers are tie. So I should get either, you know, and here the smaller number came. So there's three tests. That's probably my three test cases. Test where the smaller number is first. Test where the smaller number is second. Test when the two numbers are the same. Okay, so I should get uh, answer one, three, Actually, if I make this, I should get one, one, one. Okay, I should get one, one, one. That make it easy for me to read the test. That should give me one, one, one. Oh, what did I do wrong? Oh, they're not. I'm. They're. I keep forgetting to. Yeah, it's double here. So the results are double. Okay. And if I want, I can make those 0 0 2.0, 2.0, 1.0, 1.0, 4.0, 1.0. All right, and, 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 yeah, I, I could type. I could type in any. I'm just making them round decimal, not round doubles. But they're still now they're doubles. Okay. One one one. Okay. So I might test. Yeah, I think those are reasonable tests. I, I tested when the smaller number is first, when the smaller number is second, and when the numbers are tied. So that seems reasonable. Okay. Nick. All right. So now, yeah, like you, see, you like, watch this. Put float there. Okay. Okay. See so what? See what happens. Now I got a little error here. The reason is because. See these numbers? Those numbers are not floats, they're doubles. If I put a little F there, that makes that number a float. See, Java is kind of funny. If you put a decimal place in a number, it defaults to being a double. So that one is a, a, a float, a double. 
So if I put F here, let's see if, that, if Java will be happy now. That, that makes those numbers floats. See, they like, it was happy now. I gave it a float and a double. See, I still get, it still worked. See, it did work. Kind of, it's kind of goofy. Somebody would say, well, why are you comparing a float to a double? And the trouble is now it doesn't work with, uh, see, it doesn't work now with doubles. See, it, it, it won't work now with doubles. It'll work with floats, but it won't work with doubles. Whereas uh, if you go back to the way it was, this will work with both doubles and floats. What this did is it took the float and converted it to a double for me. Okay. It, it just added more decimal places to the float. So, you know, a, a float has eight decimal places. A double has 16 decimal places. So all it did was add more zeros to the end of that float and made it into a double. So it'll, this method now will take floats as input and convert them to double. But when it was a uh, double here, the function actually did a little bit less work. See, now it only worked when the input was floats and it won't convert the, like, why won't it convert, uh, why won't it convert a double to a float? See, tell me, why won't it just automatically convert a double to a float? Uh, uh, it won't convert a double to a float because when you're running it and it goes to the method, it's looking for a float integer. Whereas if you were going from a from that float integer to the double, well, it's don't say float integer that to the That's double. A, don't say float integer. Float number. Oh, yeah. Float number. Sorry. <laughs> integer is what, okay. No, no. It's no. Think that wasn't really the problem. What? Why will it not convert a flo a double? to a float. Why won't it shoehorn that double into that float? It will shoehorn a float into a double, but not the other way around. Like it will shoehorn that float into that double, but it won't shoehorn that double into that float. Why not? Because the float had less uh, decimal points, right? Yeah, so what does it have to do to shovel? What does it have to do to, to cram the float into the, the, to cram the double into the float? What does it have to do? You have to cut the decimal. It has to cut. So, so for example, suppose my float was, my, suppose my double was this. There's a double. That should be, that should still be a double. Oh, um, okay, so there, there's a double. To turn it into a float, you gotta chop it off at about like that. Programs won't throw away your information. See, then it would be throwing away a whole bunch of information. To take that, to take that double, and put it in that float, you'd have to take this number and chop it off to about there, eight decimal places, throw away all this information over here. The compute, the Java is designed never to throw away information. On the other hand, when you take a float and make it into a double, all you're doing is adding zeros to the end of it. So if this was my, if my float was like that, you make it a double by just adding all those zeros at the end. You're not adding information. You're not subtracting information. You're just padding it with a bunch of zeros. So you can convert a float to a double effortlessly without any loss or addition of information, but you can't convert a double to a float. Given a double to convert it to a float, you got to chop it off and throw away a bunch of information and Java's designed never to throw away information. Okay, so, so it will not convert a double to a float, but it will convert a float to a double. So that would be another reason why to make this thing double double, because I make it float double, it works with fewer kinds of numbers. You know, it doesn't work with as many kinds of numbers anymore. Okay, so, so the, the, the really 
clear thing would be make that a double, okay? Then you could give it either floats or doubles. Give it a float, give it a double. Yeah, so this is a float, a float, a float, a double, a float, a double, and it'll be happy with those. It'll convert all the floats to doubles. Okay, so it, just, it converted all the floats into doubles. Okay, all right. Okay. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and we'll do, do an example with arrays. So let's go and now switch back over to doing something with one of the, uh, an example with uh, an array. <clears throat> oh, and I give you, I, uh, here's some practice problems. After the test, you can, here's some practice problems for working with arrays. They're, they're in this one book. This is what some of the mixed up code problems where you have to, or, you know, you have to drag the code over here to get it in the right order. Those are real nice problems. And then here's a few simple, uh, I do five, six, seven, nine, and 11. So there's a bunch of programming. These are actually where you write code. So um, this one's number five. So the numbering's kind of system. So there's five, five, six, and seven. Do five, six, seven, and then nine and 11, okay? Do those, there, there's, there, these actually ask you to write the code. So the other page, you you just rearrange the code. This one is one where you write the code and it'll test your, like the, like the uh, um, coding bat, it'll test your, it'll test your program for you. Okay, so I get, so after the exam, practice with some, uh, practice doing some array coding. Okay, and then there'll be a homework, there'll be another programming assignment up there in a couple, af after the exam. Okay, there'll be another program that starts, it'll have you practice, have some, you will write some code using arrays. Okay, all right. So I've got, uh, oh, let me see, I forgot to copy it over to my desktop. Um, let me get an example, I have an example. Okay. Let me open Dr. Java. There. Fine. Oh, and Dr. Java started up wrong again. Close it. Start it again. Okay. This time started right. Let's look at this. Okay. We want to do is write a write code. That, that it's going to take an array. Here I'm making an array, a big, a big array, one million items, a big array. I'm going to fill it with random numbers. Okay. And then I want to find the largest and smallest number in the array. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate. I'm going to fill. I'm going to create a array that holds a million numbers, and I'm going to fill it with random numbers between one and fifty million. Okay. Okay. Since I'm there's fifty million possibilities, but there's only going to be one million numbers, so I only expect to get one fifth of these numbers. So I don't know what'll be the largest or smallest. If I flip that over, if I generated fifty million numbers between one and a million, the largest number would be one million, because if I pick 50 million numbers between one and a million, I'd be very sure to hit. Uh, yeah, I have a very high probability of hitting the highest number, one million. But if I pick one million numbers between one and 50 million, I don't know. I, you know I'm, I'm not likely to get the number 50 million. I have only a one in a five chance of getting the number 50 million. You know, so so but this is what, that's what we're going to do. We're going to generate one million numbers and look for the largest and smallest out of of, of them. Okay. Now, okay. So make the array that's really big. Now I can't run this in the Java visualizer because I could run this in the Java visualizer, but I have to just make this like 10 numbers or 20 numbers, but I'm going to go ahead and run it with 1 million numbers. Okay. So there's a million numbers. Then here's the random number generator. 
Okay, now here's an, a loop that starts at entry zero, goes up to the length of the array, and for every entry in the array, it puts one random number in there. Okay, this is a random number between zero and 49,999,999, because that's what random, that's what next thing gives you. Yeah, remember, it make it easy if you did uh, next int five, you get numbers zero, one, two, three, four. If you do next int 10, you get numbers zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so this is between zero and 49 million, 999,999. Then I add one to it and it becomes a random, it becomes a random number between one and 50 million. Okay, so if you do one plus this, then you're getting numbers between one and 10. Okay, right? So, so there's the, that, that fills the array up and then I can, then I can go start looking for what's the smallest and what's the largest number. The key idea is to use the first number in the array as a guess. What guess that it is the largest and guess that it's also the smallest. Now that's possible if all the numbers in the array are equal, which isn't likely to happen, but if all the numbers in the array were equal, then, then that number would be both the largest and the smallest. So I'm gonna make a guess that the first number is the largest and it's the smallest. Then what I'm gonna do is gonna go, I'm gonna step through the whole array and check that and update my guess. I'm gonna step through there. Okay, so I'm gonna start now. I've already used the, the zeroth element of the array. The zeroth element of the array is my guess. So now I start with the element one in the array. Element one is the second item in the array. So now I'm gonna ask, is the second item in the array bigger than what I think is the largest so far. I've got my, this. think of this as my guess. So far, this is the largest number I've seen. So, so I, this is the largest number I've seen so far. Is the next number I see larger than it? If the next number I see is larger than what I've seen before, I change my guess to be the largest number I've seen so far, okay? So, so you make a get, you, you, you take the first number and say, well, okay, the first number is the largest thing I've seen so far, because that's the only number I've looked at. Then you step through the array from beginning. For each number in the array, you say, is it bigger than what I've seen so far? If it is, it's the new guess at what's the largest number in the array. Similarly for the smallest. If the current number, if the number I'm looking at is smaller than the, this is the smallest thing I've seen so far. If this number is smaller than what I've seen so far, I make it the, I make this the new smallest number. Okay. So I'm going to go through the whole array and check every number. Is it bigger than what I've seen so far? If so, it's the new largest number. Is the number I'm looking at smaller than what I've seen so far? If it is, it's the new smallest number make it the new smallest number. Okay, so go through the whole array, do that, and then print out the answers. Okay, compile. Okay, and then run it. And what's kind of neat is, notice it ran in a split moment. You notice how fast that ran? Even though it's doing a million numbers, modern computers are you know, really fast. Okay, the largest number was Almost 50, yeah, I'm almost hit. You know, notice the largest number was pretty close to being 50 million. It was 49,999,002. Okay. And the smallest number was close to zero, you know, 13. The, you know, the numbers were spread, the numbers were pretty much spread all over there. Then you could run it again. It runs in a, just an instant. The, the program, yeah, you, know, you could even make this now instead of, uh, 1 million, make this 10 million, okay? Compile it, run it, okay? Notice the smallest number. Now, when I generate 10 million numbers between one and 50 million, I've got a, you know, a one in five chance of hitting the smallest number and the largest number, okay? I almost hit the largest number. I was one off from the largest number. OK. If I generate 20 million numbers or actually make create 50 million numbers between one and 50 million.
See? Yeah. Um, why are we hitting 499? Why aren't we getting 50 million? Did I do something wrong? I get this, the smallest number is one. There it is. Okay, there's 50 million. Boy, it took a lot. To, I took more than I thought to get 50 million. Okay. See, I'm generating 50 million numbers between one and 50 million. So I have a pretty high chance of hitting the highest number. But I had to actually run it three or four times before I hit the highest number. Okay. And if I generate 100 million numbers between one and 50 million, I'm almost guaranteed to hit the highest number possible and the smallest number possible. Yeah, almost every time I run it now, I'm gonna hit the highest number possible and the smallest number possible. See, all right. But notice that the computer in a split instant can do 100 million numbers. Yeah, you know, essentially it's rolling a die 100 million times and it just does it in a split instant. It's just amazing how fast these things are. Do a billion numbers. There's a billion numbers. Now it takes a little bit longer. Ah, it takes a see there. So, you know that made my computer actually work hard for 15 or 20 seconds. A billion, you know, it created a it literally created a billion random numbers. Okay. And then, then search for it. And of course, if I'm going to create a billion numbers between one and 50 million, I'm going to get, I'm going to keep hitting the, the largest and smallest. If I go down here and make this, uh, now it's a billion numbers between one and 5 billion. Okay. It's a billion numbers between one and 5 billion. So I only have a one in five chance now of getting the largest number. Oh, but that's too big. Yeah, those numbers don't even fit. That, um, yeah, th that then then the numbers are just too big. Okay, so um, I forget. I think two billion was this, the biggest it can go. Yeah, the two billion is about, two billion is about the limit for for integers on a on a in Java. The biggest you can do with integers is about two billion. So there's a a billion numbers between one and two billion. So I got a 50-50 chance of hitting the largest and smallest number. Notice I hit the largest number and I came close to getting the smallest number. Now I got two billion, but and I got four for the smallest. And if I yeah, so yeah, you you, you know, one of the nice things about writing programs like this is you can actually build up your intuition on random numbers and probability. Uh, and which is important in programming because if you know if you play games you know that games do lots of, of rolling dice and things like that and you know it's uh, writing these kinds of programs is actually a good way to build intuition about what random numbers and what you know what it means to generate large numbers of random numbers okay yeah you, you actually can get a good sense of how these random numbers work like i knew is i have a one in one i have a 50 50 chance and notice I got one of the two. I have a 50-50 chance and I hit the largest and I missed by, and I came close to the smallest. Well, that makes sense. I'm doing, I have a 50-50 chance and I'm doing two of them, smallest and smallest, and I hit one of them. And if I run it again, again, I have a 50-50 chance of hitting the largest and the smallest, but since I'm doing two of them, two 50-50 chances, that means I have a pretty good chance of getting one of them. Almost the chance is, you know, the probability is almost one that I'll get either the largest or the smallest. Okay, there I got the largest again. Funny that I got the same answer. Yeah. That was just a kind of a weird coincidence that I got the same answer twice in a row. Okay, there I hit the smallest, but not quite the largest. I've got a, 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 a almost a, a probability of almost one of getting either the smallest or the largest. There I got the, sm the before I got the largest, but not the smallest. This time I got the smallest, but not the largest. And if I and if I and I got a one in four chance of getting both the largest and the smallest. I have a one in four odds 
of getting both the smallest and the largest. So if I do this a couple more times, I'll probably get both the largest and smallest because it's a one in four odds of getting both of them. If you like to gamble, programs like this, you can sit there and, and run them over and over again because that's essentially what gambling is. Now, this time I got neither one. See, I have a one in four. I, you know, yeah, that time I got neither the largest or smallest. So I can just keep running this, but I will, it won't, I won't have to run it too many times before I get both the largest and the smallest at the same time. Okay. And, and that's exactly what, well, that, that's all gambling is. It's just rolling, it's just random number generators. Yeah. And getting an intuition for how these work is, you know, step one and learning how to play poker. Okay. Yeah. And, and it's, but it's also good. Programmers work a lot with random number generators. They're, they're ubiquitous, especially if you write games. Because so much in games involves doing, you know, simulating, being able to flip a die or, or roll a die or, or, or flip a coin. Okay. All right. So let's look at another example of, now, um, here, the interesting thing is, like, this strategy of, if I want to find the largest or the smallest, I, I, do, I do it by making a guess, saying, okay, the first number in the array is just what I think is going to be the largest number in the array. And then I'll just go through the array and check my guess and update it. That's a strategy that's real useful for lots of things. Make a guess, then start stepping through the array and make a test that lets you update your guess. Make a test here. Well, the test is, well, the number I'm looking at is larger than what I've seen so far. Well, if the number I'm looking at is larger than what I've seen so far, that number is now the new, that number is now the new largest. So that's a common strategy. Go through the, the array, checking your guess. And if you if you've determined that your guess needs to be updated, you up you update your guess. Okay. Okay, let's look at let's look at a couple more minutes. Let's look at another example. One that's a little bit harder. Oh, actually, let's do one thing. Uh, it's probably a good idea to put this up in the visualizer and just kind of watch it with a smaller number. Like we're not going to, in the visualizer, we can't watch it run with billions of items. <clears throat> but we can do something like an array of, so 20 numbers between one and 10, or actually make that 10 numbers between one and 20. That'd be more interesting. 10 numbers between one and 20, or make it one and 50. Okay, so 10 numbers between one and 50. So we're, you know, we have, we'll get approximately one fifth of the range. Okay, so 10 numbers between one and 50, and then, you know, let's, wa let's watch it do its work. So with a simple case like this, we could watch it, okay? So there's my array that's gonna hold 10 numbers. So now it's gonna get filled up. Oh, maximize it so I can see more of it. So notice that the visualizer does this quirky thing of doing dot, dot, dots. It doesn't wanna show you the whole array until it has to. So there's zeros from here to here. Six, seven, eight, nine are all zeros. So the visualizer tries to show you as little as it need. I'm not sure why they thought that was a good idea, but um, it, it tries to show you as little as it can. And it uses dot, dot, dots to say that there's zeros between there and there, okay? So as it fills in, oh, and then now here it's switched to just zero, 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 okay? Okay, there's the array filled up with my random numbers. Okay, so I'm done filling up the array now. I'm going to guess that 42 of all the kind of quirky coincidences, 42, and I'm going to guess that that's the answer to everything. Okay. So see my largest number, I guess it's 42 and my smallest number, I guess that it's 42. Okay. Now I step, now I start stepping through, but start, I start here. See, I start at 23. Okay. Because I already guessed that 42 is the, is going to be the right thing. Now, is 23 larger than 42? The answer is no. 
so I'm going to skip over that. Is 23 smaller than 42? The answer is yes. So I'm going to update my smallest guess to be 23. So you can see how this is working. So it now updated the smallest to be 23. Okay. Now, if you notice, 42 is the answer for the largest. See? So, so by coincidence, that was the right guess for the largest. So as we go through the loop, the largest is never going to change, but the smallest is going to change here, won't change here, won't change here, won't change here, change here. That will actually be the final answer. Then the smallest won't change, won't change, won't change. Okay. So go through and just kind of see what's going on. Now I'm at I equals uh, two. So I'm at this slot here. See, I is two. I'm at that slot there. 14 is not larger than 42. And 14 is smaller than 23. So I'm going to update my guess to 14. Because okay? I see that 14 is smaller than 23. So now I've got 14 as the guess for the smallest. Okay. Now I'm going to slot three. Okay. 36 is not smaller, is not larger than 42. And 36 is not smaller than 14. So I'm back up here now to four. So now I'm guessing four. Now I'm checking four. Well, 31 is not larger than 42 and it's not smaller than 14. So now I'm going to check five. Okay. 32 is not larger than 42 and it's not smaller than 14. So now I'm over to six. Okay. So now I'm going to check item six. And now I'm going to see a change because six it's not larger than 42, but it is smaller than 14. Okay, so now I'm going to update this. Now I'm going to update smallest. Okay, so smallest is now 42. Notice that my program can't quit. At this point, my program's got the right answer, 42 too, but it has no way of knowing that because it has to look at the last. You know, we see that the answer is, we see that it's done, but the program, the algorithm, the steps have no way of knowing what's to the right of where it is. So the program is going to step its way through to the end, even though it at this point does have the right answer. There's no way that it could somehow figure out that it's got the right answer. It has to go all the way to the end. There could be the number 50 at the end or the number zero at the end. So one of these two might need to be changed when you hit the end. So it's now going to go through and now we're at eight. Now we're at nine, that's the last one, okay? Now we're at index 10. Well, index 10 is off the end here. So now we're get, now this thing's gonna fail. This test is gonna fail and we're done. And we can print out the answer, 42 and two, okay? All right, so that's watching it work. You can, you can see, you know, you get a sense that it's gotta go all the way from beginning to end. There's no shortcut. You know, even though you and I can see where the answers are, that's the largest, that's the smallest, the program has to step its way all the way through. The program doesn't see what's in the array until it looks at every item in the array. Okay. All right. So it, it's kind of nice to do once to do at least one of these and, and watch it run. So you get a, a, a sense of how it, how it really is working. Okay. Now let's look at an example. It's a little bit harder. I'm not sure if we'll finish it. We want to search an array. <clears throat> what that means is we're going to create an array. We're going to go work. This time we'll we'll do things with small numbers. So actually, we can take this one and put it in the Java Visualizer. Whoops. Now, okay, I'm going to put this in the Visualizer. This is a little bit harder of a problem. What I want to do is search an array. And I've actually solved it a bunch of different ways. Here's solution one. Here's solution two. Here's solution three. Now, we don't have time to do all of them. So I'm just going to delete. I'm gonna, we're just going to do number one. So I'm going to go ahead and delete these. OK, 
Okay. So I'm just going to do it one way. So I'm just going to I'm just going to do it one way. So I'm going to create an array of size 10. Fill it with random numbers between one and a hundred. Okay. So ran, uh, just so I got 10 numbers between one and a hundred. I want to see did I get the number 50? I want to alert. I want to search for the middle number. Did I get the number 50? I only have a one in 10 chance of getting it. So if I generate 10 numbers between one and 100, most of the time I actually won't get a 50, but I wanna search the array for the 50, see if I get a 50, okay? And okay, we're out of time, but here's what we're gonna do. Well, actually, the, 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 what's, what, what, here's the hard problem. If I find the number, I should tell you where I found it. Well, actually, I could, here's a, what kind of answer should I give you? I want to search an array to see if a number's in there. I could give you a Boolean answer, true or false. Yes, I found a number. No, I didn't find a number. Okay, that's a good, that would be one way to write things. But another thing to be, would, be, would be interesting would be to tell you where I found the number. And that's what we want to do. We want to actually say, oh, I found the number at entry 72, or I found the number at entry five. So where is the number in the array? So search for it and find it and tell, tell me where it is. Now, the funny thing is, if you don't find it, what kind of answer should you give? You can't say false, because you're either going to return an integer that's the index of where the number is, that's one possibility, or you return true for found it, false for not find it. If you're going to return an integer of where it is, you can't return false when you don't find it. So you have to come up with an integer that somehow says, I didn't find it. The question is, what would be a good integer to return when you didn't find something? And the answer has to do with the way index of worked in, in strings. You remember when you did index of, you asked for what's the index? This is exactly what we're doing. We're doing index of for an array. Does anybody remember, what did index of return when you couldn't find a character you're looking for? If you ask for the index of, so if you have the string dog and you ask for the index of A, does anyone remember what the answer would be? There's no A in dog. What do you remember? How did it see if you ask for the index of? O, this is index 0, 1, 2. So if you ask for the index of O, you'd get 1. If you ask for the index of G, you'd get 2. If you ask for the index of D, you'd get 0. What if you ask for the index of A? Does anybody remember, what do you get? Was it error? No, it's not an error. Yeah, see, what it had a way of telling you I couldn't find what you're looking for. It's not an error to ask for the letter A in dog. It's not there. Same so remember, what did it tell you back as a way of saying I couldn't find it? It give you back zero if you look for D. It gives you back one if you look for O. It gives you back two if you look for G. And if you look for anything else. Anybody remember? It gives you back a number that can't be the right answer. See, it gives you back a number that couldn't be the right answer. Now, what's a number that can't be the right answer? Anybody remember, what's a number that would be a number, but it can't be an index? Negative one. Negative one <coughs> can't be the right answer, 
So that's its way of saying, I couldn't find what you're looking for. And that's what we're gonna do for our code up above. We're gonna return negative one when we can't find what we're looking for because it can't be the right answer. There is no index negative one. Negative one would be over here. There is no index negative one. So that's a, that's a convenient answer that says this is not the answer, that, the, that that thing is not in what you look for, okay? So that was the way index of works and that's why we're gonna make this one work. So we'll quit now. Oh, um, the, the exam, if anybody's got Brightspace open, you should be able to download the exam. But anybody got it open? Can anybody check real quick? Does anybody have Brightspace open? I'll check in a bit. I'm yeah. logging in. Yeah, it's if if, any, if you you know, it should be available. You, know, you should be able to uh, download the exam just like the last time. So it should be exactly the same kind of thing as last time. But it should be there. And you know you've got till eleven o'clock this evening to to, <coughs> to upload it back. And oh, and I'll answer emails during the day. If you have like before, if you have if you have a question about you're afraid you might be misunderstanding something, or if you want a little bit of clarification. You know, if you're just not sure about something, send me an email. I got other classes today, but I, I should be able to answer the emails. I may not be answering you know, within minutes, but I'll try to, I'll send you an answer eventually. So yeah, I've got classes, but I'll, I'll answer you. You, you know, if you, if you want to ask a question, I'll go ahead and answer eventually before tomorrow. Okay. But, but that, you know, a lot of you asked questions in the last exam. That's fine. So you say, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer as soon as I can. Anybody got, anybody have a chance to get, get into bright space yet? I see it now, it's there. Is it, okay, good. Yeah, so so you should be able to, you should see it now, you should be able to download it. So, you know, if you got questions, send me, if you've got, if, you, if you're a little bit unsure about what something's asking for in the exam, you know, I, if you say, is this the right answer? I'm not gonna answer questions like, is this the right answer? Okay, it's, it's an exam. So, uh, but but if you're if you're unsure about what it's asking, so if, if in doubt, you can always ask a question. But uh, if if you know, go ahead and ask if you have if you have a doubt. So go ahead and ask. But hey, I won't answer questions like, is this the right answer? But if you're a little bit unsure about what something is asking for, please ask for clarification. Okay. Anybody got any last second questions? Okay. So. I'll go ahead and stop sharing, okay? And good luck on the exam and have a nice weekend and we'll meet again on Tuesday, okay? Bye-bye.